Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're delighted that you're here. I'm Dan Glickman, Director of the Institute of Politics, and I want to welcome you all to the forum tonight. Two and a half years ago, the United States was attacked. In the days that followed, the Harvard and Kennedy School communities gathered here in the forum to watch the news coverage and to mourn the loss. The common refrain about 9-11 at the time was, we didn't know what we didn't know, or how could this have happened? Over the intervening years, the forum hosted debates, panel discussions, and speeches that demonstrated and showed and focused on how the U.S. and the West should respond. From former intelligence officials, members of Congress, academics, and noted Iraqi exiles, they debated the war on terrorism and the merits of a war against Iraq. Unfortunately, when it comes to weapons of mass destruction, it appears what little we did know wasn't true. As we gather once again in the forum, our guests this evening will hopefully explain how we were wrong. If I may, I'd like to say a word or two about the man introducing our guest tonight. Dean Nye has been a great supporter of the forum and a supporter of what the Institute of Politics tries to do for the Kennedy School community. He has been an outstanding dean of this great institution, the greatest school of government in the United States. And I'd like to thank you, Dean Nye. I'm not, I'm, this is not a eulogy, he's not passing on or anything else, but I just felt like uh, it's a very appropriate forum to make these comments to. In light of tonight's subject matter, he is uniquely qualified to introduce our guest. He's worked on issues of nuclear nonproliferation both in government and academia for decades. During the Carter administration, he was Deputy Undersecretary of State for Security Assistance, Science, and Technology. While there, he was also the chair of the National Security Council Group on Nonproliferation of Nuclear Weapons. In recognition of his service, Secretary of State Cyrus Vance awarded him the Distinguished Honor Award. His tenure in the Carter administration led him to write Nuclear Ethics, a book that examined the moral and ethical challenges surrounding nuclear weapons. During the first term of the Clinton administration, he served as director of the National Intelligence Council, that's where I got to know him, and then as Secretary of Defense for International Security. He has been a member of the Harvard faculty since 1964 and dean of the Kennedy School since 1995. America has so much to offer the world and so much to gain through coalition building and working with the United Nations. We would all be wise to read his new book out this month called Soft Power, the means to success in world politics. It is my great honor to introduce Dean Joseph Nye. Thank you, Dan. I, my real claim to fame as to why I got to introduce David Kay is that I've taken David Kay fly fishing. And he confessed that there are not a lot of trout in Iraq. <laughs> in any case, we're delighted to have David Kay here uh, to give our annual Corliss Lamont lecture. It was started by Corliss Lamont, who was a class of 1924 at Harvard. And it brings to Harvard a person who is widely recognized for leadership in diminishing the risks of nuclear war. As special advisor to the Director of Central Intelligence in the search for Iraq's weapons of mass destruction from June 2003 until past January, uh, David Kay performed a critical task in the hot glare of an international spotlight. Few issues have proved more contentious in world politics in recent years than the status of Iraq's weapons of mass destruction programs. And David Kay endured intense scrutiny as he carried out that work and managed to create a sense of impartiality and fact-based inquiry that was a testament to his integrity and his coolness under fire. Uh, he's not a newcomer to that task. Uh, in fact, he had previously served as UNSCOM's chief nuclear weapons inspector after the Persian Gulf War. And during that time, not only did he locate a major Iraqi center for assembly of nuclear weapons and seize a large number of documents, but he has the distinction of having been for four days a prisoner of Saddam Hussein in a parking lot in Baghdad. Those of you who watched your televisions at the time may remember that. This is why he's a little bit older and grayer than he was then. <laughs> David, is, <laughs> David is currently a senior fellow at the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies. He's had 15 years of management experience with international organizations, including the Secretary General of the Uranium Institute that works in 21 countries, 
Uh, he served as a US, on the U.S. delegation to the U.N. General Assembly, has received uh, commendations from the United States Secretary of State and the International Atomic Energy Agency's Distinguished Service Award. Indeed, we can't think of anybody better equipped to join us to this evening to tell us what really happened. And so please join me in welcoming my friend, David Kay. Thank you, Joe. That's, that's a very kind introduction. Um, I was happy when Secretary Glickman and Graham Allison asked me to appear here. About, well, I guess three weeks after that, though, I opened the New York Times, and there was Joe Nye with an axe and Molly in front. Um, I love American Gothics, but Joe, I don't suggest that you use that as your Christmas card. My wife's reaction is, I'm not letting you get behind me with an axe. <laughs> um, and then, of course, uh, this weekend, I had a colleague of yours, Richard Clark, uh, do me a great service. That is, he took the media calls away from me. Uh, I have very little advice to give Dick uh, that, except he's going to discover that there are media outlets you never dreamt of uh, that will be asking you for your views. Uh, the other piece of advice I would give him, I know he's already being compared to myself and Joe Wilson. I've had to endure this for about three well, I guess now it's almost six weeks of people asking me am I, what I'm doing like Paul O'Neill and, and Joe Wilson. My only piece of advice to Dick is when someone s says that, do not respond as I did mistakenly. No, my wife is not as young or as stunning as Valerie Palm. <laughs> that is a remark that is still costing me at home. <laughs> so <laughs> don't get flip uh, on comments like that because you have to live with them. We have a limited time tonight, and what Joe didn't say is I come from an academic background, having started but fallen away from that profession, and I have a hard time not speaking in 50-minute blocks, and I don't want to do that tonight. I really want to hit some highlights and leave some time for questions. So let me just quickly address the issues of what we found as compared to what we thought we would find, uh, and more importantly, really the lessons learned and unlearned with regard to why we got it so wrong. Now let me start by being clear. I think we got it very, very wrong. I'm convinced, I think the evidence stands to prove it, that Iraq at the time of Operation Iraqi Freedom did not have large stockpiles of weapons of mass destruction. In fact, had not created in the period after 1991 large stockpiles of weapons of mass destruction at any time during that intervening 12 years. Now, that is not to say that Iraq was in compliance with UN resolutions. In fact, with the Security Council resolution that was a justification for going to war, I think what we found is that Iraq, Iraq was in substantial non-compliance. That is, it did not make a full, complete disclosure, that it continued to hide activities. We had innumerable Iraqis take us and show us things that they were instructed not to show to UN inspectors, that they in fact had been interviewed by UN inspectors, but explained they hadn't told them the truth because they were afraid for their lives. So it's not to let them off free, but that's not the reason we went to war. We went to war because of the expectation that there were large weapon stockpiles there and they were not there. Why is that true? Why did we almost all get it all wrong? First of all, we should not be so masochistic. The Iraqis bear a considerable responsibility for this. The most important and lingering question that you continue to be asked on this is, if you're right that they don't have weapons, why did Saddam act like he did? After all, he gave up billions of dollars of oil revenue. He kept his country under massive sanctions. He was denied the freedom and commerce of international, both regional and international uh, community. He was excluded. He was a piranha. Why? What we did is, is quite clear Saddam had weapons in the 1980s. It's quite clear that when I first went in in 1991 and colleagues continued to go in, really up to 95, Saddam was trying to maintain a stockpile and a weapons program, and he refused to cooperate with the United States, uh, with the United Nations, in hiding that program. Now, the behavior was more or less consistent from 91 right up to the time of the war. Even Hans Blix said uh, in December in his first report, Iraq has not made a full, genuine commitment to disarmament. 
what we fail to see and fail to understand is consistency in behavior is not the same as consistency in the reason for that behavior. I'm absolutely convinced that after 95, when one of, two of his son-in-laws, Hussein Kamal's being the more important of the two, defected, and they decided to get rid of all their weapon stockpile at that point because they thought Hussein Kamal would give them up, that his rationale for continuing to act like he had weapons changed and we missed it. For Saddam, and this is the most important thing really in understanding Iraqi behavior, for Saddam the most important thing in the world was survival in the job. For him, the weapons program was important for one reason and one reason only. It was a thing that ensured, in his view, that the Kurds and the Shia would not rise up again. The Kurds understood Halabja. He had used chemical weapons against them. What he feared most is that the majority of his people would rise up and his tenure and his family's tenure would be ended. That's essentially all he cared about. Sanctions were immaterial to him, and partly, and we have to say we largely miss this too, we now have a more or less full accounting of the bank records and skimming of various oil monies, oil for food, and illegal trade. About six and a half billion dollars at a minimum just off the oil for food program, illegal assets. The interesting thing about that is 60% of that went into new palace construction. That's an astounding figure. And these are Iraqi figures, not American figures, something we created. It's the head of the, the head of the Presidential Daiwan, who's sort of the equivalent of the Andy Card and uh, uh, OMB director in an administration in the United States, who all the money flows through and all the records, uh, has spent a lot of time talking to us about where that money came from. We've been lucky to get the bank records. For him, there was plenty of money. The sanctions, in fact, you can argue, increased the wealth of the family at the expense of the wealth of society. So Iraqi behavior which is, as every one of us approached the war, you face this, Iraq continues to confront you and inspectors, continues to, to not fully cooperate, et cetera, et cetera, led the Clinton administration in uh, 98 to launch a military action, Operation Desert Fox, uh, for that same purpose. Across administrations, that behavior was there. First of all, so that was important. Secondly, UNSCOM itself, that is the UN inspection organization that started in 91, uh, 91 and continued through 99, um, we got so used to Iraq trying to limit inspectors to lie, cheat, and deceive that we, we became locked into the mode. Iraq can only lie, cheat, and deceive. They can't tell the truth. The interesting thing in the interrogation of Amir Saadi, who is the Western face prior to the war of Iraqis, uh, German-educated, uh, very intelligent individual. He was trotted out uh, by the Iraqis every time they had a crisis with the West throughout the 90s. Saudi told us during the interrogation, he said, in 92, I warned everyone in the government that if we continue the behavior we're on now, we're going to reach a point where no one will believe anything we said. And in fact, that is partly what happened in UNSCOM. The UN inspectors ceased to believe that Iraq would ever tell the truth. And let me give you a small example of where that occurred. One of the things about Iraq that you couldn't figure out is they claimed they had disposed of the liquid anthrax they had. Yet they had no records of the disposal. They could take us to no locations that had the physical evidence of this uh, disposal. And they said they couldn't find the individuals involved in the disposal. A thoroughly unbelievable record. Now we understand why. As a group of inspectors were closing in on the Iraqis as they moved the liquid anthrax around, they decided that they had to dump it or they would be caught. And they had been told, at no, in no case, are you to be caught with this if you do its death. So they dumped it next to a building. Unfortunately, that building was located exactly a mile and a half from the major Saddam Palace. So when they got back and talked to Rita Taha, known in the West as Dr. Anthrax, and told Dr. Taha where they had dumped it, she went ballistic. She said, if we tell Saddam we dumped 500 liters of anthrax a mile and a half from his palace, he is going to have us all killed. 
He will think it's, it's horrible. It's a horrible substance. He will believe we're trying. And this is a man who had a great deal of, uh, you know, his food tester was his most valuable member of his staff. Um, it, it was, yet they couldn't tell the UN that's what they had done because that would be, they thought, and Rita Taha said this to us, she said that would be the equivalent of writing our own death sentence if we said this is what happened to it. We dumped it right there. There were a series of these things. The UN, we were not smart enough to understand that. The Iraqis were not able to be forthcoming enough to help us understand that, and so we got locked into it. A third reason, and this became far more important as we approached uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom. We have lost in the United States, and I think far more important for the future of foreign policy and whatever government uh, follows, whatever administration follows this one. Most people believe that intelligence is important to win wars. Let me tell you, intelligence is important to avoid wars, and that's the most important reason. The ability to warn and to craft policies that help you avoid war is far more important than winning wars. What we have done is we've lost our ability to conduct clandestine operations. Now, partly it goes back to very close to a point where Joe and I both began our career, church committee hearings, Vietnam, series of actions in which the reaction was to limit the ability to do it. In 1991, when I took the first teams into Iraq, the US government had no agents inside Iraq. Now, as we started to operate, the intelligence community made a very rapid, and in many ways, I, I'm absolutely amazed even now, courageous adjustment. They decided that UN inspectors they could share intelligence with, and those in inspectors could operate to find out what was the truth about Iraq's program. Now, you probably don't realize, I, I suspect in this audience we may have Russians, Chinese, uh, whoever in this audience. In 1991, it was still classified to utter the name of the U.S. classified satellite program. Uh, I, at that time, had no active clearances, and here suddenly I was told I could share satellite photography. In fact, the Russian is a, is, a, is a great story because the Russian who was a member of UNSCOM at that time, who I took into Iraq, was a KGB agent. He was not only a KBG agent, he had been outed on the front page of the New York Times as head of their bureau, uh, their office in New York at the UN, and had been kicked out of the United States. And here I was told I could share satellite photography with him. Well, it worked out to be a very good relationship. So photography is great, except it doesn't tell you what goes on inside buildings. The resolution is great that's better at measuring the buildings than it used to be, but it's, the kryptonite vision is still not there. And so you shared it with the, uh, the inspectors. The inspectors were able to go in the buildings, report what they found, that led to a number of amazing discoveries. I'll say I wouldn't have ended up in the parking lot if it hadn't have been for the willingness of the intelligence community to share with us technical intelligence that I never before would have been allowed for myself or to share with others. Uh, but what happened, it was like crack cocaine. Uh, you didn't have to recruit Iraqi agents. And the problem with recruiting agents, for those of you who've never done this or haven't been yet recruited, um, <laughs> is the people who really know secrets that are worth knowing are not likely to be Eagle Scouts, or defrocked Eagle Scouts, perhaps. These are people who are inside criminal regimes, who are inside the criminal enterprise. Uh, and, and so you could do it without running any of those risks. It became a crack cocaine in which the blending and sharing, and it served a common purpose. It served the objectives of the UN Security Council resolution. Then in 1998, uh, in 1998, when the inspector is withdra withdrawn, another inspection crisis with Iraq, suddenly the U.S. found itself without any agents in Iraq. No recruitment had been done. And suddenly steps forward this wave of Iraqi defectors. Now, it's true they all come through one or another immigrant organization, and you do your best to try to screen them and to see. 
But the wave is so massive and the lack of evidence plus the demand of policymakers, what is going on in Iraq? And this is not true. It's wrong to believe this is just true with this administration. It was true in the Clinton administration as well. What is Saddam doing? What is Iraq doing? And you had people who were on the inside who had very compelling stories. Now the other thing that happened that we didn't understand is very often we rely on what is called liaison services. These are our allies, the Brits, the French, the Germans, others, uh, who actually do a better job of recruitment usually than we do, and actually do a better job of handling defectors than we do. Liaison services started coming forward with information about Saddam's program. But what has become quite common is liaison services do not share the names of who these are or who these people, so you don't know a lot about them. There's a single source for the story about Iraq's mobile weapons program, a single individual who is the source for that. He came out not to the United States, but to a friendly country, the sort of friendly country. Um, <laughs> this country, I mean, after all, we named an American snack food for it. Um, this, this country refused to allow the U.S. to see it, to see this individual. Uh, so we, and they refused to share his name. The result was, among other things we didn't know, is that his brother was a senior official in the Iraqi National Congress. Um, we couldn't, we had no agents inside Iraq, so we couldn't examine physically everything he was telling us. When we got back into Iraq this time, we found out that most of what he said was a total, it was total fakery. Uh, but we've lost our ability to collect intelligence. And believe me, the best, the things you really need to know, you're not going to know from space. Increasingly, you don't know from signal intercepts because people have learned that. You need to know intentions, what is happening. The fourth thing that we missed, and this in many ways I think is something that, you know, we all in the world of academia and research and think tanks owe a responsibility for not helping and insisting that governments understand that, and it's not the first time we've met it. We have found it. Iraq society disintegrated in the 90s. It descended into a vortex of corruption, of terror, and most importantly, of fear. It was unable to organize itself effectively to carry out major programs. It was only capable of rape, pillage, and the worst kinds of perpetuated frauds, frauds and we didn't catch it. Now, this is not the first time. Uh, I have a German friend of me who said, ah, not unusual. We didn't realize that the East Germans could only collect the garbage. I uh, couldn't even collect the garbage, excuse me. That when we took over, we had to, everything was there. They'd missed the disintegration, much like we missed the disintegration of the Soviet Union until it disintegrated. Iraq society, and this is the thing that I hope as you go out into, those of you who are students, as you go out into the world, understand, I hope you don't have to do it up close personal, but the most destructive aspect of a terrorist regime or totalitarian society is not the violence it carries out against its citizens, although that is extreme. In the case of Iraq, there's somewhere between 400,000 and a million people who were killed by Saddam Hussein over 35 years. It's not that though, it's fear. It's the perpetuation of fear throughout the citizenry which destroys any ability to have civil society. Everyone is spying or thought to be spying on everyone else. It destroys any ability to cooperate, to believe that the rules of the road and hence everything is, any corruption is possible, anything is justified. I mean the worst case for those of us who spent about 15 years of our life dealing with it is many of the Iraqi scientists of my age were educated in the United States, educated in the United Kingdom and in Germany. And if, in fact if they were in Harvard would, be, would behave with the best norms of academia. But they were thrust in a situation that was so completely different that they behaved in ways that they themselves admit are despicable. And the reason Jerry Bremer is having such a hard time putting Iraq together again is not just because we didn't plan to do it, although we didn't plan to do it, and that's another lecture and another story, but it's really because the glue that makes civility and civil societies possible are destroyed were destroyed by the terrorist regime. If we had understood how bad Iraq had become, 
we wouldn't have credibly argued that they had re recreated large programs of weapons of mass destruction. In fact, when I first went back in May, the thing that struck me is how bad the civil infrastructure had become. And it wasn't from the war. It was from the total breakdown of the ability to maintain and invest. The palaces were going up, but little else. Um, and let me hit one final thing before stopping and, and turning to questions. I think one of the most dangerous things abroad in the world of intelligence today actually came out of 9-11. It's the insistence of why didn't you connect the dots? The dots were all there. The 16 of the uh, 19 hijackers were already in the country. If you'd only connected the dots, you would understand it. As academics and those getting an academic education, I hope you understand the demand for connecting dots is a very dangerous two-way street for an analyst. If you don't collect, the worst thing to do is start connecting dots because you're going to draw the wrong, uh, wrong conclusion. I think when we finally do the sums on Iraq, what we're going to turn out, what will turn out is we simply didn't know what was going on, but we connected dots. The dots from 1991 behavior were connected with 2000 behavior and 2003 behavior, and they became an explanation and a picture of Iraq that simply didn't exist. We are, it's a pernicious influence on young analysts today in the intelligence community. The pressure, go out, connect the dots. You've got bits, bits, bits and pieces of information. Bits and pieces of information may allow you to draw a completely wrong picture, and that wrong picture can turn out to be as bad as Iraq. Let me just, uh, let me conclude with just a couple of comments about why I really think this is so important. I think it goes, it goes well beyond, beyond Iraq and what we should learn. The cost of our mistakes, and I think we made fundamental mistakes with regard to the explanation of why we went to war in Iraq, are far greater than Iraq itself. We are in grave danger of having destroyed our credibility internationally and domestically with regard to warning about future events. The dangers have not passed in the world we live in. And if intelligence is to serve its purpose and to serve policymakers, and policymakers are to protect the republic, and the, the, you protect it, hopefully, not by going to war. The president has said, and I think he believes, and I think is absolutely right, war should be the last resort. Military action should be the last resort. But ask yourself today, if you go as a secretary of state or the president and warn about country X, isn't the immediate response, well, why should I believe you now? You got it in Iraq wrong. You don't even admit that you got it wrong. And if you don't admit you've got it wrong, how can you fix the problem and regain credibility? You're already seeing this. I mean, if you read the Chinese press recently and the, the internal notes of uh, U.S. negotiators are coming back from China with, the Chinese are saying, well, you're wrong about the uranium enrichment program of Korea, and they said, you're wrong just like you were wrong about Iraq. And the Iranians are having a field day. I mean, the Iranians literally are caught with uh, uranium and uh, high enriched uranium residue around their facilities. But they're getting, trying to escape by saying, yeah, you planted it, it didn't exist, it was like Iraq. And believe it or not, that has credibility in some places. It's going to be far worse if we do not take the steps of admitting error and dynamically trying to fix it. And that's not an easy task. And even more important is having gone to war for the wrong reason destroys and is corrosive in the domestic political debate. If anyone doubts how corrosive the lack of credibility and the lack of belief and the truthfulness of U.S. government officials let me invite you to do some congressional testimony or to go around the country and do some speaking. The anger, the bitterness, the belief that people are lied to, it undermines the ability to have a full, free, democratic debate on the issues. And that corrosiveness is what I really worry about even far more than loss of credibility for our intelligence community. Here again, I think the answer is to admit you were wrong what I, I find most disturbing around Washington, and here's the appropriate place probably to say it, is the belief in Washington is you cannot ever admit you're wrong because if you do, the opposition and the press will hammer you. 
They've forgotten the lesson of John Kennedy on the Bay of Pigs. Kennedy accepting and using Harry Truman's language, the buck stops here, accepting responsibility for it and not trying to lay it off on the Eisenhower administration or anyone else. What most people forget is his poll numbers went up 25 points because he accepted responsibility and stepped forward. It is also true, and Kennedy is a great example of that, you do not have to accept what the intelligence community tells you. And policymakers have a right to challenge the intelligence community and to ask if they know and they're sure and to go back and re-challenge them. What is often forgotten about the other defining moment of the Kennedy presidency, and the, the missile crisis, is that the intelligence community was united in the belief that there were no Soviet nuclear warheads in Cuba. It was a unanimous judgment of the intelligence community that the Soviets had shipped the missiles but had not yet moved the warheads there. Two people in the room, the record shows, disagreed and refused the course of action that was argued on the basis of that intelligence estimate. John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy. We live in a far different country than would probably exist if they had accepted that and acted as if the intelligence community was true. So one should be careful in arguing that policymakers have to accept what the intelligence community should say. It is, it, no one gave anyone infallibility simply because you went through a polygraph, believe me. Um, there is one last thing I think that comes out of Iraq and then I'll stop that uh, is extraordinarily worrying to me. It's been heightened by what we know about Libya. And that's what I call the Amazon.com Sam's Club proliferation circles around the world. The one Iraqi program that was moving ahead and was moving ahead to create missiles, a family of missiles that would have had a thousand kilometer range, which would have ranged the Middle East, was the missile program. And the only reason it was moving ahead was because of the foreign assistance. You had from Russia, from Belarus, from the Ukraine, from Serbia, teams of individuals who came and spent time in Iraq, who went back home, provided procurement services, continuing technical advice, were designing and helping the Iraqis achieve that. Based on what we now know about, or some of what we know about AQ Khan and the others around him, I think the thing that Iraq, we should remember about Iraq, is it didn't reach the point that we thought it would, but it showed some signs that we ought to worry about with regard to other countries are other groups. I mean, the same type of technical assistance, for example, how to do a radiological device, could as easily be supplied to a terrorist group as it could have had to a country if you've got the money. So there are some important and really frightening things. In some ways, I believe that Iraq was more dangerous in a way that we didn't anticipate than it was dangerous in the way we thought and turned out to be true. A society that is failing, that is falling apart, but has the technical knowledge to create weapons of mass destruction and is utterly corrupt in a world in which there are people trying to buy that, the marketplace will eventually put buyers and sellers together if you give them a long enough time. So we need to do that. Uh, and just one last thing with regard to Iraq since so much of my recent life has been spent there. I think if you spend any time in Iraq today, you cannot help when asked the question, was the war worth it? to say that the Iraqi people are far better off without Saddam Hussein, uh, and probably the region and even us are worth it. And I think this is important to understand, not because of justifying what we're doing. My real fear is that 10 years from now, an Iraqi historian, probably Harvard educated, will write the book that explains that the West only cares about us Arabs, us Iraqis, if we have oil or if we have weapons that threaten them. They don't care about us if one or the other of our leaders is destroying our society even though they know it. I think that's a charge we're going to have to live with and it's one that we all as individuals ought to be concerned about. We moved against Iraq for what turned out to be the wrong reason and it's probably the only reason that would have gotten international action despite the fact that here was an individual who cured, killed between 400,000 and a million of his own people, engaged in a war with Iran, which killed a million, uh, was utterly and completely destroying a society that is going to take a very long time if we stay the course to put that society back. And yet we have to admit, 
we probably would not have gone to war for those reasons. That is a damning charge against Western democracy, which we deserve to think about long and hard. Thank you very much. I must tell you, I thought that was a very powerful uh, presentation by, I think, a very uh, great and courageous individual. So now is our chance to open it up for questions or comments. We have two microphones on the floor and two microphones up there. Uh, we would ask you to identify yourself. We ask you, please, don't make a statement. Ask a short question if you can, because uh, there are an awful lot of folks who are interested in, in asking questions of David Kay tonight. So, Saying that, uh, we will begin with this gentleman right here. Uh, Chuck you can Kogan. Yourself, Chuck Kogan, Kennedy School. My reaction to this very fine talk is that this is nothing new. We should examine ourselves as a people and examine our history. We have a history of plunging into war. Spain, 19, uh, 1898, crossing the 30th, 30, 38th parallel in 1950, introducing ground troops into Vietnam, and now Iraq. And I think we really have to do some introspection about what we are as a people. No, you're, I mean, it's a very valid point. I, any of us who went through good diplomatic history courses know that in the course of U.S. foreign uh, diplomatic history, you learn that you usually go to war uh, on the right side, but for the wrong reason. I mean, a classic case, of course, is Woodrow Wilson, unrestricted submarine warfare. Uh, is a justification for going to war. It was, a, it was against the right opponent, thank God, uh, if he had realized what the Brits were doing, Wilson might have actually gone to war against Britain. Um, and the history would have been really different. No, it's a serious point, and we do have to understand it. I, I accept that. My name is Nathan Rosenberg. I'm a junior at Harvard College. Um, I watched your hearing with the Senate um, Armed Services Committee, and I was just surprised, probably naively, um, how political the senators were about your <laughs> suggestions. And I was wondering, you've made a lot of suggestions about um, intelligence gathering. Have they been received well by Central Intelligence in the Congress? No, I wouldn't describe the reception as well by <laughs> Central <laughs> Intelligence. Uh, by the Congress, I don't know. There are a serious number. I mean, look, if you saw that hearing, there were two hearings going on. And the questions were in two phase. There were questions either defending or attacking the president, which was sort of, I, I've described it, it was because of when it occurred. It was the feeling if you go to a Super Bowl party to watch Super Bowl on television, and everyone else there is to watch the commercials, uh, you know, a group of ad guys. These guys were here to play politics. On the other hand, having said that, there was not a single senator who didn't ask good pointed questions about what had gone on and the intelligence and what I'd found. So I thought it was, uh, it, it was a political hearing at one level, but there were not a, a lack of very serious and pointed questions. Uh, in follow-ups, and I've, had, I've certainly had more with the members of Congress than I have with the CIA, um, there has been great concern about those in follow-up, and there was actions going on. These are serious issues that do not have easy answers. Can, can I just ask a follow-up to that? What about the pointed questions by the Congress or anybody else beforehand? I wonder if you might comment on that, or the lack thereof. Well, Dan, there were pointed questions. I went with a number of my colleagues, and the government officials certainly went, and there were a lot of, there were a lot of pointed questions. Uh, I had the great, because Martin Frost is uh, actually my Texas congressman, um, and chairman of the, was chairman of the Democratic Congressional Caucus. Uh, Martin, actually, Gebhardt asked me to do it, and then Frost presided. Um, I went to talk off the record in closed session to the Democratic uh, Congressional Caucus, and there were a number of very pointed questions about the fact of the matter is, since so much of the evidence and so, almost everyone had a very consistent view of what was going on about Saddam, and Saddam's own behavior sort of validated it, we simply got it wrong. Now, should, I think you've put your, your finger on something I think is a larger question. I'm struck at how little contrarian analysis was done in the intelligence community. Quite frankly, I mean, you know, all of you know, because you're, some of you have roommates there. You're all interested in politics, but some of you must know people in the B school. Uh, George Soros got rich because of contrarian thinking. Uh, at any time in the government when everyone says, everyone knows, 
alarm bells should go off and you should start examining the foundations of those beliefs. For example, if anyone had said with regard to the mobile biological program, which the Sec Secretary Powell spoke of, what is the evidentiary base for that? And you had gone and pulled back to that, you would have come to one individual who no American had ever directly talked to. Now that doesn't pass the laugh test as far as I'm concerned. And I think if Congress had known that, it wouldn't have passed the laugh test as it's not now that they do know it. Up there, yes. Yeah. Good evening, I'm uh, Tian Segal, MPAD second year, International Development Program. Um, you're inviting us to think about the role of the United States vis-a-vis uh, -vis dictatorship and help to democracy. <coughs> So I'd like to turn the question to you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, in the case of Iraq, do you feel that <coughs> the use of force was justified or even necessary to, uh, to get Saddam Hussein out? Well, I don't think uh, Saddam would have left by any means other than someone's using force. Uh, you know, this was not a regime that was open to democratic transformation. Um, so I think force one way or the other was the only way to remove him. Now the question you're really asking, I suspect, is was it worth it? Um, and I confess, my basis for answering that is simply because I have spent so much time with Iraqis and seen what he did to the country uh, that I think in, in looking at it, uh, there is a personal tragedy and horror that is hard to watch, you just can't wash it away from you to believe that the country is better off without Saddam. It's, it certainly remains a dangerous place. There's a lot that's wrong that is going on. But transformation is possible now, the way it was not possible for 35 years. The question was more whether force was like the one way to do it, or if you feel that you could, uh, Saddam could have got down in a different way. Look, I've had Iraqi scientists come to me and say, we, would never, we did not tell and we would never have told you and inspectors what we're now telling you, and then taking us to place where equipment was hiding. Do I believe that the UN inspection mechanism would have gotten rid of Saddam? No, I don't think so at all. Thank you. Yes, sir. My name is James Williamson. Thank you. Um, I appreciated your comment at one point earlier in your talk where you said most of us, almost all of us, got it wrong. I think it's important for us to remember that there were some important voices who got it, who apparently got it right. Principal among them, I think you would agree, uh, was your former colleague, Scott Ritter, who I think some people here will remember speaking up in the Malkin penthouse months before the war was f uh, fully launched in the fall of 2002 and laid out an extremely cogent critique of the alleged case regarding weapons of mass destruction. Now, my question to you is, what, it, what is your take on how is it that there was somebody like Scott Ritter who seemed to have gotten it right, who wasn't heard more by the American people, by Congress, there was an opportunity for him to testify that previous summer, which did not occur, and given the fact that there were people, experienced weapons inspectors, saying the kinds of things he was saying, isn't it plausible to make a case that the real reason for going to war was not any of the ones that you correctly mentioned, but was that we have an administration that was determined to launch this war, whether there was evidence of weapons of mass destruction or not. Oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question, and let me give you a two-part answer. Why does Scott not have a larger impact on the American public and on the American political process? I think you have to look to Scott for that. Scott changed his either. views so radically from when he left. Go back and read his first testimony after he left. Uh, and he literally came apart in, against a friendly journalist in the New, Sunday New York Times Magazine. I've talked to the journalist. The journalist was set out to do a favorable story on Scott. And if you recall, if you read it, it comes out as an individual who is just off the wall. And Scott sort of put himself out against the mainstream. I debated Scott on a number of times in the lead up to the war, and it was one of those incredible things you almost hate to do because it's too easy. Uh, Scott starts killing himself by sort of going to the extreme and, and starting shouting. He did not have the temper to 
to make a reasoned case. Unfortunately, in a democracy, you can be saying things that ultimately may turn out to be right, but your mode of saying it, the way you express yourself, your arguments, and you marshal them can kill you. I think that's largely what happened in the case of Scott. And Scott confused all of us who were, were his friends. We could never get a rational argument out of him. Now, there may have been other reasons there as well. With regard to your serious charge, do I believe that this was an administration that was determined to go to war, damn the evidence one way or the other? I do not believe that at least those people in the administration, that certainly includes the President, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, Director of the CIA, that I dealt with on a personal and frequent basis. I, I genuinely think they believed that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Did they believe that Iraq was a serious threat? Yes. Uh, but they did not make up the case in their mind for weapons of mass destruction. Um, and I, I, just, I just don't believe it. I dealt with them on too many issues at too many levels to believe that they were completely lying about it and just made it up. I don't believe it. Yes, sir. There. Go back here. Hi, my name is Aaron Miller, and I'm in Regional Studies East Asia, a graduate student. You made one brief reference to North Korea, but I was wondering if you could comment further on any lessons you've learned that you feel would have an application to that situation. Well, I think any, anyone looking at North Korea now has to come face to face with something you never thought you had to come to, is um, what if they're bluffing? Um, and how do you deal seriously with a country that may claim it has nuclear weapons, may be putting the evidence out there, and may be doing it to achieve a political purpose, uh, and yet doesn't have one. You cannot believe how difficult it is to prove the case of a country that acts like it has weapons, has many of the attributes that you can observe, but much that you can observe, and come to the conclusion with any degree of confidence that yes, it definitely has. There is a tremendous bias in the intelligence system about believing evidence that is put before you. And if that evidence is out there to lead you to the wrong conclusion, penetrating that evidence is very difficult. And let me say, North Korea is a lot tougher problem than Iraq in terms of assessing. We have very few people who understood Iraq and Iraq internal politics. But those few people are a magnitude larger than the number who understand North Korea. Thank you. Andy. Hi, uh, Mr. Kay, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is uh, Andy Frank, I'm a junior at the college. Uh, my question has to do with, um, there's been a lot of foreign policy debate and um, I've read a lot of things about how the neocons, Wolfowitz, Cheney, Rumsfeld, et cetera, um, saw the biggest uh, intelligence problems as one of underestimation of threats around the world, um, specifically the Soviet Union's uh, weapons arsenal and then um, after Saddam Hussein, the first Gulf War, and all the weapons were found, which you obviously have, know a lot about. Um, I, I was wondering, um, assuming that intelligence can't get better, um, I know that that would be the ideal solution, is it more dangerous to underestimate or overestimate um, uh, weapons of mass destruction in hostile regimes? Andy, I think that's an important question, and you've got to remember how important it is because of an event that has nothing to do with intelligence. I'll tell you from dealing with the President, I'm absolutely convinced that there was a shadowing effect from 9-11. That is, having seen what 9-11 occurred, the unanticipated and, and serious consequences of it, the risk calculus of this president changed. That he became less tolerant, he became more risk adverse as opposed to being willing to run risk. Now the problem in the world of intelligence, it's sometimes said facetiously, but only half facetiously if you're inside, is the problem with intelligence is half of it's wrong, half of it's ambiguous. You just don't know which half is, ha is there. You're dealing with regimes who do not cooperate with you. You're having to gather information that they're trying to deny you. And the real information you want is not inside file cabinets. Uh, and this, I think, is something that really needs far more academic study than it's got. The intelligence organizations that we have today oh. were constructed to deal with denied territory, the Soviet Union building big things. The problem today are denied networks and denied minds. It's individuals and what they want, their intentions, their collaboration, and it's not big things. And so. I think in a world like that, where the, the event can occur in the homeland, you're going to find any political leader. 
very concerned about underestimation of threats. Uh, and the fact is, if you look at intelligence, we spoke about diplomatic history. Um, and I've spoken to the Secretary of Defense about this because that's really was his view before he came in. Intelligence is almost always wrong, is Rumsfeld's view, and I think he's largely right, is almost always wrong with regard to timing. Intelligence may occasionally get it right with regard to direction, but with regard to when something will occur or something will be ready to occur, that's a degree of finiteness of resolution that you're seldom able to do because you're not able to penetrate the denied minds, denied network problems. Real spies steal secrets from file cabinets, and that's not where that information resides. So I actually, I think it remains. Serious underestimation is a huge problem. Now that creates a bias. It may mean that you tend to worry about problems and take action against problems that really don't exist or may not occur till a much longer time and you have political ways of dealing with it. And I think the real lesson from Iraq, well, I think there are a number of real lessons from Iraq, but one is let me take the one of preemptive action, uh, which is the way of dealing with problems that uh, you, may, you may not be sure about the estimate of the timing. Preemptive action requires pristine intelligence. We clearly don't have pristine intelligence now. So the real lesson is to go back to understand that the service of intelligence is not to help you win wars or blow up buildings. The sur real service of strategic national intelligence is to warn the policymakers early enough so political solutions with one's allies can be sought to deal with problems. And that's where we've got to go. If we don't, we're into a world of hurt. Thanks. And yes, lonely sir. world of hurt. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm a, from Joe Harrington from Belmont, Mass. I'm a decorated flyer from World War II, and along with some of my three fellows that I know very well that were in the infantry, we're dismayed with what's going on over there. By innuendo, these people who are in Washington and the regime have people convinced 70 percent of them think that Saddam had something to do with 9-11. He had nothing to do with it. I don't understand where the, there is an outrage at what they're doing to the country and killing all those GIs and wounding them and killing so many of those people who are in Iraq. Why isn't there more outrage about it? Uh, you've got the wrong specialist to tell you that. I, uh, look, I, 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 don't, I think there is a, a huge bias in our country to accept what the leadership tells. Uh, there's also, for those of us who came through the trauma of Vietnam, there's a natural reluctance to challenge uh, at the time where you have American men and women risking their lives daily in Iraq. Um, I'm, uh, we've got an election campaign. Let's see what the reaction is, what the results are. I'm actually, uh, I'm optimistic that in fact, whatever the truth is, the truth will come out. Yes, sir. Right here. Hi, Mr. Kay. Uh, my name is Greg Atwan, and I'm a junior at the college. Um, I want to ask about your assessment uh, of pre-war Iraq, and specifically, if Saddam had the money to build all of these palaces um, in the, the numbers that you're citing, why didn't he build weapons to back up his bluffs? Well, in the city where the big dig went on for almost <laughs> as long as I went to, <laughs> I've been coming to Cambridge. I, I, I feel a little uh, embarrassed to have to explain corruption to you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> civil construction, uh, and I'll say this not uh, against Massachusetts. Let me say it against mm. my own home state of Texas, and certainly the neighboring state of Louisiana. Um, <laughs> Highway construction has always been an activity that politicians have loved to engage in because it makes it possible to keep one's friends, uh, friends uh, and in the fat of life. Look, Saddam, all Saddam worried about, he, weapons would be useful if you wanted to use them against someone. What Saddam wanted is power to continue to live continue to enjoy the incredible wealth and pleasure and the pleasure of terror uh, that he and his sons and family enjoyed. And so for him, real weapons weren't of use. You can't get much corruption off of real weapons as opposed to 
palace construction and other construction. It was, and this is what Americans need to understand. It's actually what CIA analysts need to understand, who also don't have much experience with real corruption. They should come to Massachusetts. Um, <laughs> corruption itself destroys and distorts your politics and your values and your system. And that's what really happened in Iraq. It was an empire of terror and corruption. Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kay, for your interesting remarks tonight. Uh, my name is Mike Farrell, and I'm a, a mid-career student here at the Kennedy School. And uh, during your talk, you related to us the incident where the Iraqi scientist was unable to tell Saddam what she did with the uh, anthrax. Have you ever considered, or is it conceivable, that Saddam didn't know what he didn't know, and that they, in fact, lied to him about his weapons systems or lack thereof? Uh, in fact, we document quite a bit of, of lying to it. Saddam made a change in 1998, which was absolutely devastating. To those of us with academic backgrounds, one wonders why he did it. Saddam in 1998 changed the approval process for the expenditure of monies by the Military Industrial Commission, the main conduit for money for military spending, and required that all proposals go directly to him and he would make the final decision on them. A really frightening thought, if you think, even in terms of the United States uh, of that. And so what happened was a circle of people holding hands under the table, that is, Small groups would come in and propose weapons programs, get money directly from Saddam, come back in a year, uh, state what progress they had made, completely unaudited, unvalidated progress, get more money and continue. Uh, and most of that turned out not to be real. Now, that didn't relate to weapons of mass destruction. It related, Saddam had a thing about air forces and air defense and air attacks. His own air force couldn't fly, we could, we were flying every place. So he funded a large number of science fiction projects for air defense that produced nothing and yet they promised great res results. And in fact, there's some interesting stories after the second night of this war about what happened to his uh, air defense chief as a result of being called on the table. Now, there was a vast amount of lying and reporting. I'm absolutely convinced, though, that it was not in the era of we have chemical weapons or we have uh, biological weapons, but we really don't, and he believed they had them. The reason I'll say that is because we have a complete record of in 2001, 2, and 3, in fact, uh, three months before the war started, of his asking how long it would take to restart the chemical and biological program. We've got the documentary record of that. So it's quite clear he knew they didn't have those programs there. But there was a vast amount of this line and it affected a lot of expenditures on military programs. And it also, if we'd understood that, it would have told us we really don't have to worry about this because what happened, and we have a rocky testimony on that, instead of collaborating in large teams and trying to produce one weapon system, they, they formed small teams and came in with six weapon systems, which he funded all of in small amounts. The reason they did this, come on, there's enough grantsmanship in here, because each team could get a little money as opposed to one team in which you would get less money that way. So that sort of corruption is well documented. It was a fact of life in Iraq. And we, should, we didn't know it, and we should have known it. Thank you. We'll take three more. The, this gentleman here, this lady, and this gentleman, that's it. Yes. Uh, good evening. My name is Alexander Rossolimo with the Center for Security and Social Progress. Uh, my question deals with Iraq's nuclear program. Depending on the sources, Iraq is believed to have spent between $5 billion and $25 billion to try to develop an atomic bomb. The $25 billion upper limit is significant because that's exactly how much the U.S. spent on the Manhattan Project in today's dollars. So my question is, how much did Iraq spend in total on its nuclear program, and how close did Saddam come to having an atom bomb? Most of Saddam's expenditure on his nuclear program took place prior to 1991. Uh, the best records we have indicate there were about 10,000 people involved in the program. I've never heard an estimate of the upper number that comes close to $25 billion. 
Partly it may be, you said, in today's dollars. There is a vast problem of calculating, as there is in any developing country, translating, and particularly totalitarian countries, uh, translating labor costs and all into it. What we do have are figures on their imports, and those were paid in their national dollars. I think the figure was, is probably somewhere between five and ten billion dollars of expenditure. The nuclear program ceased to exist as a program towards a bomb in the early 90s. We <coughs> took it down, we destroyed it, he didn't build it back up. In 19, in, uh, pardon me, in 2000 and early 2001, the Iraqis apparently realized how seriously depleted their nuclear establishment had become, and this was actually their best R&D establishment. And they started putting some money in to build up new facilities out there. The real problem was human capital. They could not send. Their nuclear elite that I dealt with, Jafar, Dia Jafar, and the others, had all been trained in the West, been trained in the best institutions around the world. The graduate students, the students who came of age after 1991 could not get out. They were not well trained. The experiments they started carrying out in 2001, 2, and early 3 were primitive, a poor shadow of what they had done in the mid-1980s. At the time of the war, they were nowhere close to a nuclear weapon, if you mean one in which they developed the fissile material themselves. Now, the real trick to that answer is, what would they have done if they had had sufficient plutonium or high-enriched uranium laying uh, some way it came into their possession? Could they have fashioned a nuclear explosion, explosive device? Yes, they could have. They had people who understood that. It would have been primitive, but primitive depends on your distance from the explosion as to how much you appreciate <laughs> the primitiveness of it. But in their own self-developed program, nowhere close. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much for your remarks, Dr. K. Uh, my name is Nahal Gazemi. I'm a student at Harvard Law School. And I was wondering, given the fact that intelligence is so difficult with something like biological and chemical weapons, given the fact that it's so easy to conceal them, and there are so many of them that are dual-use weapons, what role do you think that uh, enforcement protocols like the verification annex of the Chemical Weapons Convention and the draft protocol to the Biological Weapons Convention can play in uh, weapons verification and non-proliferation in the future? It's an excellent question to end with because, in fact, I think it points to the future. We have spent much of the last 15 years divided into two camps, the treaty huggers who want to hug a treaty and protect it against all comers, and those who believe that treaties and inspections are inadequate and want to look for preemptive or unilateral use of force. I think what we learn out of Iraq is that the real challenge today is to ensure that we make inspections effective and protocols effective so that, in fact, we can penetrate the programs. Uh, look, we should all be embarrassed that the Iraqi program began under international treaty and went ahead, uh, that the Iranian program <laughs> survived for 18 years before it finally came to light, thanks to a defector, uh, that the North Korean program started in the Libyan program. We have got to find ways to make those protocols effective so that proliferants genuinely fear detection, and that detection is credible. That is the, what ought to be at the very front of the agenda of the next administration as it approaches arms control. And we've got to stop dividing ourselves between those who think treaty is the be all and end all, the others who believe they'll never succeed, and we have a B2 is always the best treaty enforcer. Uh, we've got to find a way to make inspectors smarter and more capable. Thank you. Gentleman right here. Hi, I'm Nick Smith. I'm a junior at the college. Uh, you mentioned that they went to a big effort to sort of connect the dots on the intelligence. Uh, and last night, Dick Clark came out and talked about how, with 9-11, um, Hadley specifically uh, demanded that he review his report that there was no connection between Iraq and 9-11. Um, so the administration has, uh, as the gentleman over here said, they've insinuated a lot of the connection between 9-11 and uh, Iraq, so that 70% of people now believe it. Uh, they basically lied. Uh, nobody comes out and says that, of course. But um, they exaggerated the WMD evidence, as you've said. And you mentioned also there's an election coming up. Um, as, as you've been talking now about the next administration, I'm wondering why haven't you been tougher on the Bush people? I know you say that you think they really did believe that there were WMDs. But why haven't you been tougher on them for exaggerating the threat to the extent that they've sent people to die uh, for a threat that really wasn't there? 
Well, let me say, I have read the intelligence from the U.S. I've read the intelligence from Britain, from France, from Germany, from Russia. The intelligence reports that were written throughout the 90s up until the war from all of these sources pointed to weapons of mass destruction being created in Iraq. There were, the evidence was there. Uh, the evidence turns out to be wrong. I think it's, you know, there's a thin line in politics between what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. I'm waiting for the headline in the Washington Post which says, Secretary of Agriculture picks worst arguments to support policy. Uh, it, it doesn't... I did that frequently. <laughs> yeah, but you never intended to. Um, you know, there is a thin line between what some refer to cherry picking and what others refer to picking evidence, to absolutely distorting and lying about what the intelligence said. I do not believe, although I think it is a perfect subject for the inquiry, the independent commission, to see, in fact, if the politicians distorted lied about the, what the intelligence. It clearly is across that line if you say the intelligence says this and it doesn't say that. Um, I think we, the next administration, regardless of who will be better off, would be better off, in fact, if we improve our intelligence capability than it would be simply by beating the Bush administration. And let me tell you, if the phone call comes to Joe Nye, if John Kerry is elected president, and Dean Nye is asked to become director of the Central Intelligence. My free advice to Joe, yeah, it's a good idea. Uh, I don't think Molly would like it, but it's a good idea. Um, my advice to Joe would be, that's a job you will not, should not take unless you demand that the next president commit himself to reform of an institution that was based on a national security situation that no longer exists. I think the real problem that threatens us is failed intelligence, not lying about it. And let me just say one thing about what, and then I, I, I'll end, what Dick Clark said, and what you, you said, and it's a problem, I've read in the book and I haven't read the book. I see absolutely nothing wrong in fact, actually, I would be critical of a national security staff after an event like 9-11 who didn't come to all of its experts and say, is there any evidence of Chinese involvement? Is there any evidence of, I think that's the point where you lift every rock up, you look under it hard. Now, let me tell you, Dick Clark and others who serve are not wilting violets, as you should know. No one is going to be intimidated by Steve Hadley say, go back and be sure you're right. In fact, if you are intimidated by Hadley saying that to you, you shouldn't be in the job. Uh, and the same thing I would say, and I've said about intelligence analysts in the CIA, is the fact that the vice president wants you to come to work on Saturday morning and ask you tough questions you're not going to be in, you, and if you are intimidated by that, you ought to go find another job. And one last personal story. I had one chance in my life to brief, before this job, a vice president. It was Hubert Humphrey. I was, 15 minutes I was going to invite Hum, in, go down and brief Humphrey on a subject when I was working for Arthur Goldberg. Was I intimidated to know it? Hell no, I was juiced up. I was happy to do it. Now, as it turned out, I didn't brief him for 15 minutes. Humphrey briefed me for 14 and a half minutes. <laughs> and I had, I had about 30 seconds of telling one. But intimidated? No. I look forward to it. Analysts really like attention of people who can make policy because we all know as analysts we can't do anything. <laughs> uh, we, we write. Hell, we're graduate students. Uh, you know, the chance to interact with policymakers, and if you ever believe you're intimidated by someone asking you if you really believe it, do you believe it, relook it, go find another job, sell insurance. Uh, you don't belong in the real world. Well, let me just say, I hope there's a good transcription of this because there are an awful lot of pointers. I suspect there are people in this audience who will be presidents, senators, governors, national security advisors, directors of central intelligence, secretaries of defense, and I've missed you, David. I don't know what you'll be, but you'll be something. <laughs> And uh, I, I think that uh, we've learned a lot of uh, pointers about how, what you have to do to do your job effectively because the goal here is to serve the public, the people. 
the people who pay the taxes, the people who work hard, the people who are going to war, the people who are dying and being injured for this country. And so I think that Dr. Kay has done a great service by coming here and talking to us very openly and candidly about a lot of these issues. Let's give him a big applause for his speech. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to ask you, Ben, but you've already done it. If you were going to be, if, if you were president out there, what candidates would be the president to do? But you've said that already.